Welcome to Punchline Talks, the big interview. My name is Mark Owen, and today I'm joined by my special guest, Bishop Rachel. Hello, Rachel. Good morning. Good to see you, Mark. Well, it's it's absolutely lovely to meet you. It's funny, I was thinking to myself when we first came on, uh, what I'd actually call you. And I think the big problem is nowadays, less and less of us go to church, let's be honest. And and so I was thinking, do I call her Bishop Rachel? Do I call do you, do you find that as a big problem? Yeah, people do often say to me, um, how should they refer to me? And I say Bishop or Bishop Rachel. Um, I said, really, as long as you don't call me anything rude, I don't mind. Um, the official title is a bit of a mouthful because it's the Right Reverend Rachel Troik, uh, Lord Bishop of Gloucester. Um, but I very rarely use that. Uh, but around and about the diocese, it would be Bishop Rachel. Now, I would have trouble introduce, introducing people anyway, people who watch this show. So thanks for letting me shorten that. Well, it's the same with the dean, I suppose. What do you call the dean? I mean, some people say, well, I call you Bish or Dino or whatever. No, it would be, it would be Dean. But yeah. So now the dean, I always think, is the CEO of the church. They look after sort of the, the is, is, is that how you say it? No? Or where, where are you the CEO of the church? So the dean... Um, is the person who uh, leads in the cathedral. So in each cathedral in the country, there will be a dean. And then the bishop is has oversight of the whole diocese, uh, which does include the cathedral. Um, but there's a very special relationship there. And then um, from the 42 diocesan bishops, uh, there is then the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of York. So that's how the Church of England uh, is structured. And then a number um, of other bishops. So in this diocese, we're very blessed to have Bishop Robert, who is what's known as a suffragan or assistant bishop. Um, and there are a number of those in each diocese as well. And a diocese is a bit like a county. So, um, so, that's, so really well, then, but we go beyond the county, but it's that sort of idea. Yes. So you really are the chief executive then, if we were going to look that's, at it. That's there. probably, yes. If you, if you want to... <laughs> To, to look at it in those terms. I also um, work with what's called a diocesan secretary, who's probably a bit more like the, the CEO of the diocese in terms of oversees all those who are employed by the diocese, so not the clergy. And Benjamin Priest-Smith, who is our diocesan secretary, um, he and I uh, work closely together along with a number of other senior staff, but it's quite a complex organisation. I was going to say, let's talk about facts and figures, uh, please, because I know there's 390 churches. Um, how big an organisation is it that you run? Yes, it's a, it is a big organisation. Um, so the diocese actually runs from just north of Bristol and stops just south of Stratford-upon-Avon. So it includes Gloucestershire, part of South Gloss, a little bit of Warwickshire, a little bit of Worcestershire and Oxfordshire around it, because um, these are ancient boundaries. Um, and then Lots of church buildings, as you've said, uh, 390 church buildings. Um, many of those will be grouped together in what's called a benefice. Uh, and then we have 117 Church of England schools. Uh, we have lots of projects, community involvement. Um, so, yes, a large organisation, lots of clergy, lots of lay leaders, and then lots of people who are employed by what we call the Darson Board of Finance, who work in our finance and property team, um, leading our children's work, um, leading our HR, our safeguarding. Um, so lot, you know, lots of different departments, uh, all based here in College Green around the cathedral. But I always say that central is not here. Central is the communities where our clergy and lay leaders are leading and connecting with their wider communities. Because literally it's thousands of thousands of people. That, and I was talking to a number of business um, colleagues and associates, and, and I was I, we were talking about who who are the most influential, say, mm. business women in the county or, or, or women in the county, and your name came top. And I thought to what? myself... <laughs> Quite, that's quite interesting because obviously you are so connected. Your the church does still strand out to everything, especially on the charity sector as well. How, yes. how long have you been here? Sorry, in post. Um, so I've been here nearly eight years now. So I started in September 2015. I was consecrated as a bishop in July 2015 at Canterbury Cathedral. Then I actually started here as bishop in September 2015 in the middle of the Rugby World Cup. 
<laughs> we remember it well. Well, well I you, remember it well. Did you go to some of the games? Um, I did, actually. And I don't know really much about rugby, and I, I'm still trying to learn being here in Gloucester. Um, but, I mean, it's really interesting you talking about that sort of influence, because one of the things when I arrived, one of the things I was really tasked with was to help the churches uh, across the across the diocese be even more outward focused it's something I'm passionate about being a, a key part of my own journey how do we link with the wider community so I have tried to um, really build good partnerships and relationships uh, across the county and beyond and I think one of the things that bishops are able to do is convene people so um, you know several times a year I will often bring people from charities and business and the public sector together um, and and hopefully have some creative conversations. When you say convene, but do, do, I'm sorry to say I'm ignorant. When you say convene people, what what do you mean? Bring everybody. I mean bringing together. people together for a conversation. So just recently, um, you know, we had a gathering at the Music Works, which brought together people from the public sector, from health, from education, from business, from charities, um, coming together really just to reflect together. So I always say there's no agenda, people aren't taking away a to-do list, but how might we um, do some reflection together and what it means for us to be leaders. And we're looking at what it means to be leading in, in these sort of difficult times. So, you know, I can do things, um, things like that. And I do try to be out and about as much as I can be. The other bit I have to my title is I'm also now the Anglican bishops, the Church of England bishop for prisons in England and Wales. So that's another little part to my little part to my role. I was going to say, we're more hats than Ian me, which is quite difficult. Um, <laughs> how does your normal day pan out? So very lovely for you to join me today, but you oh. must be incredibly busy. So what time of day do you get up, and when is your day finished, and what happens in the middle? Yeah, I don't think there's any such thing as a normal day. Um, people often think that Sundays are the days that are the most full, and actually they're not. Um, so I am I am very much um, a lark. So I get up about between about 5 and 5.15 every morning. Um, it allows me to have some quiet. It allows me to have some space to pray. Uh, and then usually my, my sort of working day, um, so I was into the office here, um, about quarter to eight this morning um, and today it being holy week there are some very special things this week but on any any day usually my week will be will have things in it ranging from meetings which will be one-to-one -one meetings with clergy with my team with staff through to um, being out and about uh, doing things out in the in the wider county meeting with people school visits uh, lots of obviously strategy and vision conversations. I'm usually in London once a week in the House of Lords, uh, once a week, once every 10 days. Um, I'm doing a lot with prisons. So last week I was out in uh, prisons for two of the days last week. Um, it's no two days are the same. So today, when I finish with you, I'm over to the cathedral to actually have um, a rehearsal for the installation of our new Dean on April the 23rd. There are still places available if anyone wants to be there to welcome our new Dean. Um, and then um, I have got various uh, things to do today, not least finishing off a sermon for a big service in the cathedral tomorrow on Monday, Thursday. This evening, we've got, a, we've got um, a gathering in the cathedral for all those who are coming to be baptized and confirmed at the vigil on Easter night, the day, the Easter Eve. That's quite unusual. People think I spend a lot of time in the cathedral. I don't, that's one myth I'd really like to bust. I don't run the cathedral, the Dean does. Um, I'm quite often in the cathedral during the week for morning prayer um, in, in the mornings, but I don't do the services on Sundays in the cathedral, except at Christmas, usually at Easter, but not this year, um, and Pentecost. So people often ask me how things are going at the cathedral, and I say, you need to ask the dean. <laughs> I am out and about across the diocese. So last Sunday, celebrated Palm Sunday at Stowe on the Wold, on Easter Day, I will actually be in Eastwood Park Prison with the women there. Um, on Friday, I'll be out with two different churches who are doing activities with children and families 
Um, so, you know, on Monday, I was out throwing around as ball with our sportly work, our work we do with sports, um, have a great team that engage with people, particularly across some of our new housing areas. And I was playing a game around us with some other young people there. So no two days are the same, but I have to hold the big picture and then do some of the detail day to day. I mean, we're going through a real you know, cost of living crisis at the moment. Uh, charities are really under pressure. Schools are, are under pressure all the way. There's so many different things going wrong with society at the moment. Uh, where do you start? You know, how, how do you divide your time up? Uh, yeah. You know, what? how do you go about that, Rachel, to try and help as many people as you as you can? You know, the church can. Well, I think going back to your um, really significant word of influence earlier, if you go to most local communities, and we do have, as the Church of England, we have a presence in every community, the influence there will be the local clergy, the local lay leaders who will be working in partnership, hopefully, in the wider community, whether that's food banks, toddler groups, after school clubs, warm spaces at the moment are really significant across our communities. Uh, most of our church communities taking part of that. So I think for me, it's how I hold that big picture and encourage and lead so that at local level, that's where the influence is. And I think one of the big things for me as church through all of this is saying, yes, we are living really challenging times. Um, how do we speak hope into that? At one level, as we're being a bit provocative, we've always lived in challenging times. Mm. Just the challenges have been different. So I, I do find it hard when we talk about crisis at the moment, you know, everything's a crisis. Um, the climate crisis, the cost of living crisis, the fuel crisis, the crisis in Ukraine, whereas usually crises are quite short lived, they're acute, whereas I think that these are how life is at the moment, how do we live into that, I don't think that language of crisis is always helpful, um, throughout history, we've been living challenging times, people weren't aware of so much of what was going across our world, so we didn't have social media or in the internet, now we know everything, don't we, you know, straight away but I think for me the church being a place of hope in that coming alongside um you know people often say to me you know as the church well how can you believe in God when all these awful things are happening and, and I think Holy Week's a really great time to be having this interview because Holy Week reminds us that that God walks with us you know the place of crucifixion was a place of utter pain and suffering but it was also about ultimate love and then three days later on Easter Day, you know, we will proclaim that Christ is risen and that love and life are stronger than even death itself. So I think for the church, it's not about being glib and we've all got to walk around with smiles. It's about how do we authentically engage with people's pain, their struggles, as well as their joys, and say that God's hope and love will are far stronger and far greater than anything else um, we're experiencing. And that God's with us in our pain. So that's really important for me about what it means for us to engage with our communities. For people of all faith and no faith, I'm confident about my faith and I want us to be there for all people to speak that hope. Do you feel that uh, the media itself has a part to play in this? You talk about crisis, um, you know, find the, the language very disturbing. I, you know, I, I work in the media and I find it very disturbing. It's like very de derogatory all the time they seem like you know nothing is good anymore everything has to be like as you rightly said a crisis do you feel yeah. they've got a big part to play in this i i do i so agree that doesn't mean to say that i am not a great supporter of the media i'm talking to you now um but i do think that uh, the way we look at our world i think what shapes our lens and the way we look at things is the media i think what's scary is that we don't always see that um so that what we see as our reality is often just what we're seeing in headlines. Uh, people just want sound bites these days, so people would far rather read the headline than all the nuances. Often there are some really good um, journalistic articles, but people just read the headlines. And I would certainly say in my role with prisons, um, perhaps shouldn't get me onto this, but I, I think our government as well, I think often, is doing policy by media headline. What will win votes? So in, in criminal justice, um, the, the headline is 
let's lock away more people for longer or make our streets safer. And that is just not true. That's not what the evidence says. Um, and, and I think we have a broken criminal justice system, but until we can change some of the narrative and work with the media to do that, most people will tell you that we're soft on crime, we need to be tougher on crime, and we need to lock more people away. We have our, our crime rights, crime, um, our, our streets are no safer because of that. And we have in Western Europe, the highest number of people in prison ever. And the probation service is a complete basket case. We did a we did a we did a magazine around five or six years ago when they tried to privatize yeah. the probation service, and uh, and ever since then it's it's been stuck together by sticky plaster. That's well, you see, I probably would disagree with you there. Oh, I good, think okay. the way that probation service has now been reorganized back into a national regional system. Um, I think is actually a really good thing. We're seeing far more join up. And again, the headlines will always tell you about the one or two cases where something goes tragically wrong. And there will always be those. And one is too many. But actually, what you don't hear about is all the 99% the where everything's gone really well. The people who have come out of prison have not recommitted those serious offences. So actually, I work very closely with the national probation um, system. And like all these things, they're overstretched. Um, why would you want to be a prison officer or a probation officer or a social worker at the moment, to be quite honest, because you're vilified? How do we support those people? And I think the media could really help change the story. But that's probably a whole bigger subject, which we could do an interview on another day, Mark. Well, I, I hope we do. I really hope we do. No, it's very interesting to come in back. Back to that, really. But let's go back to yourself, actually. So you've been here, you said, eight, nine years. Um, where did you come from? Where did you go to school, Rachel? Ah, so I grew up in Broxbourne in Hertfordshire. Um, very proud to say that I primary school was my local Church of England primary school. That was the local primary school. And from there, I went to the local comprehensive, which I'm also very proud of. Um, and so that was where I, I, I grew up. And then... Um, the only ambition I've ever had in life was to be a speech and language therapist. About the age of 14, I didn't ever wanted to be a teacher or a doctor. And someone mentioned speech and language therapy to me. And um, I in fact, went up to the children's hospital in Hackney just to see a speech and language therapist at work. And that was my only ambition. And so um, I completed my A-levels. I then went to the University of Reading. Uh, which had a really good um, course for speech and language therapists. And I did a four year degree there um, and training and then uh, moved to London as a paediatric speech and language therapist and remained in London for all my time until I came to uh, Gloucester in 2015. So but I did a you... number of different things during that time. Yeah, so how did you become a, a bishop then? How did you join the church and... What yeah, well, I was a, a, a speech and language therapist in London. I, I loved it. Um, worked in health centres and schools and it was for a time at the Royal Free Hospital with their child development team. Um, and then during that time, I had a really strong sense that God was calling me into the church full time. I was a Christian. I was involved in a local church. My faith was very important to me, underpinned my daily life. Um, and I began to get this sense uh, quite worryingly, I had no desire to go into church. I went to speak to my vicar eventually, plucked up the courage and said, I'm just wondering if God is calling me into the church full time, thinking that would be many years in the future. And he rather scarily looked at me and said, I've been waiting for you to come and say that. Oh, terrifying. Anyway, how, how, uh, old were you, how old were you then? If oh, I was in my late 20s. Um, and probably worth saying at that time that women could not be priests in the Church of England. So that makes the story perhaps even more uh, strange. Um, anyway, fast forward a um, few years later. Was that I, a I was... Sorry, was that a difficult journey for you then to become a priest? I mean, I, you know, I don't know the background, I'll be honest. Yeah. With you. So, so what happened there? So I went to Theological College in Oxford. Um, and whilst I was at Theological College, uh, the vote went through the Church of England General Synod for women to be ordained priests, but not bishop. 
Um, and so when I came out of theological college in 1994, a long time ago, um, that was the first year that women could be made priests. So I feel like went through the system normally. I was made a deacon, complicated in the, in the church, you're ordained deacon first. And then many people then go on to be ordained a priest a year later. Some people stay as deacons. Um, so I was then priested in 1995. I was at a church in Tufnell Park in London. Um, and uh, from there, I went to be uh, a vicar. And then I was a vicar in Bethnal Green in the East End of London. And uh, whilst I was there, I then got asked if I would consider being what's called an archdeacon. Every bishop has one or more archdeacons, who, if you like, are a bit like middle management, um, dealing a lot with um, clergy in their parishes with things like um, buildings and finance and deployment. So they work with the bishops. I got asked if I would be um, an archdeacon in northwest London. Uh, so um, I got married at that point. So I got married late in life. So I did, uh, I think, within a space of a few weeks, um, I moved, married, changed my name, changed jobs and went to North West London, where I was Archdeacon over Hillingdon, Harrow, Ealing and Brent. Um, did that for five years. My husband was then a curate in West London and I he, he worked in business in the city. And he then became a curate uh, in, in West London and then... At the end of that time, um, he then became a vicar in the city of London, and I got asked if I would go and be archdeacon in a different part of London, in Hackney Tower Hamlets and Islington. We were quite happy living in the city, just by St Paul's Cathedral, me working over those uh, three London boroughs, um, and, and within the Diocese of London more widely. And then it wasn't possible for women to become bishops until 2014. November 2014 and in January 2015 I got a phone call to say was I willing to be shortlisted for Bishop of Gloucester I didn't know I'd been long listed so that was quite interesting um, and I was interviewed in February in 2015 um, alongside other people um, and uh, then was announced in March 2015 and may be consecrated the bishop in the July. And um, in all of that, very strangely and humbling it, as it was, I was the first female diocesan bishop um, to, to come into the Church of England. There had been other suffragan bishops, two suffragan bishops before me, um, and then I became the first diocesan bishop. And how did that happen? Um, I don't quite know, uh, but I do believe that this is where God's called me to be um, and I'm also very quick to say to people in business, in the church, children in school, people in prison, I am no more important than you. Um, we are all equal. And this is my calling at this time. What was your first impression of Gloucester when you came here? Well, you Gosh. Would seen, um, you, would, you, you would have seen the cathedral. Wow. But as you walked around streets of Gloucester and you know you visited the, the cross and then you went over to Cheltenham and you know uh, I mean it's so different isn't it you know the forest of Dean it, it's so diverse it's the beauty of living here in some ways but yeah. what was your yes absolutely impression? yes um, so I, when I was in that my announcement day on March in in March 2015 I hadn't actually looked around before then I wasn't allowed to come and look around in case anyone got a sniff of who was being interviewed so uh, on my announcement day, I was actually announced um, over at the Royal Agricultural University uh, because I wanted to be out and about from my very first day. So I was announced there, then went to All Saints Academy in Cheltenham to where again, followed by media all day, then over to the Forest of Dean to a hospice, then to the women's prison at Eastwood Park. And I didn't actually come to the cathedral till the evening. So actually it was saying something about the church being out there and then I, I was met by the then Dean um, in the cathedral that evening. And I think my number of different impressions, one was just delighted by the diversity of the urban and the rural. Um, having come from Hackney and Tower Hamlets and Islington in the city, delighted to find Gloucester as what my husband will refer to as quite a gritty city. Um, you know, people often think this is a posh 
um, cathedral city and it isn't. Um, lots of deprivation in Gloucester, um, lots where I really could see the church's role of hope being important. Um, I remember the smell of pot as I walked into Gloucester and thinking, oh, is it just like being in London? Um, and, <laughs> and actually as well, I think being struck by um, that, there, that in Gloucester, there was quite a lot of ethnic and cultural diversity, but that wasn't so strong in other places and not as strong as where I was living uh, across Hackney to Hammets and Islington. Um, so yes, I think those were some of my first impressions, but re being really warmly welcomed. I think having a sense that the count is quite a can-do place, lots of people who want to do things, initiate things and roll up their sleeves and get involved in things. Um, so yes, real diversity. I couldn't agree with you more on the warm welcome and the can-do place because I, I, I'm not from Gloucester originally myself. You know, we're from we're from Wales. I'm kind of running out of time or, already, Rachel. So uh, unfortunately, I've got to ask you first of all in your in your CD player in your car. Have you got a CD player or your you know what was the the last CD that you bought? Oh, last CD. Or, or, what, or maybe you might have some music on your Spotify or, or yes, album you know, that you download. I'm trying to find sound, out your music. This is going to sound incredibly pious um, because quite a lot of the time when I am on my own, I actually like silence. I think silence is really important to listen to the noise within us. But um, I, I have a, a wide range, I guess, of you know, if we're in the car, will often be um, classical FM that we'll have on. Um, I I love um, Adele. I love, you know, a range of, of modern music. But actually, the last track is going to sound very pious, but um, it's a track I put on my Spotify at the weekend called um, The Woman at the Well, which is based on a story of Jesus encountering a woman at the well. And I put that on my Spotify because last week I was in a women's prison and the women had um, heard this song for the first time. I'd never heard it before. And it so deeply touched them about Jesus' love for this woman who was so broken. And they wanted to show me a film of the song. And uh, I was so moved by it, I came home, put it on my Spotify, and I've been playing it all through this week. I thought you might say it would be take that, actually, because you're... Oh, well, do you know, I do, all, today. I do love all that kind of... The things like, you know, I'll still go back to... Um, you know, Simon and Garfunkel and uh, Elton John and all those, you know, I love ABBA. That's a bit of a, that's going to be a bit embarrassing, isn't it? But you nothing know, wrong, do, nothing wrong with loving ABBA. I do. And it, actually, if you get me, I, I love a good bop. And if you get me on a dance floor, it will be the dancing queen every time. Fantastic. Well, I've got to ask you your top three business tips, please. Yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that. And if you ask me on different days, I'd give different answers. But this morning, I thought, what would be my three top business tips? And I thought the first one would be know what good looks like in your context. I think in business and in organisations, if you don't know what the good would look like if you lived it well, if you haven't painted that picture of if we live this well, what would good look like for the community, for our business? And what would that transformation we're hoping to, to make look like? If we don't know that, I don't think you can set really good aims and objectives, vision and strategy, if you don't know what it is you're aiming for. And too often, I think we get down into the detail of what do we need to do rather than what's the big picture that we're aiming to achieve that we need to keep in our mind. So that'd be my number one. My number two would be uh, go on discovering who you are. I think as leaders, we have to do lifelong learning. Um, actually go on discovering, yeah, what our weaknesses and strengths are and how to use them, which I think links in with my, my third one, which is you need diverse people around you. If you're in a business or organisation where you have a team, build a diverse team. Don't build a team in your own image. You need people who see things differently, who can be critical friends, people you trust that can be critical friends. That's been really important to me. And if you if you work on your own, if you're a sole business person, then I'd say, who are the people you are going to put around you as friends, as advisors, who will see things differently from you and bring challenge as well as encouragement 
And that kind of links with that with the second one, which is that's how we go on discovering who we are and what our strengths and weaknesses are. Bishop Rachel, that's all we've got time for today. Thanks ever so much for joining the punchline. Punch, I forgot what I was going to say. The punchline talks, the big interview. If you like the show, please like, share, subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Bye.